It's a pleasure to be here today, September 17th, with people literally scattered halfway around the world, ranging from Cambridge, Mass, to Singapore. Uh, people are Astrid Kunze, who's in the Neues Handelshochschule. I hope my pronunciation isn't too bad. We have Joanne Tan, who's National University of Singapore University of Management in Singapore. And we have Zoe Collin, who's at Harvard Business School. What we're going to talk about today is in preparation for a conference being held starting in about 45 minutes on women in leadership. What I want to do is ask each of them some specific questions about their own work and then get their opinions about uh, more general issues to which their works apply. So let me start off with Astrid and ask her, you're talking in your work about the glass ceiling. And my question is, Norway, Germany, to a much lesser extent, the U.S. have substantial parental leave policy. Question is, if we expanded that even further, made it longer term, made it paid, would that solve the glass ceiling problem? Or to what extent would it reduce it? Well, in our new research, we have looked exactly at this question. We looked actually at the, the parental leave extension from short to long. So if we focus on the long leave, so what we find is, for Norway, that actually extending the leave, so paid leave, fully paid leave with a guarantee to return to the same job, has not affected at all the likelihood to climb to the top positions. And how we measure top positions is that 10 years, 20 years after women gave birth, may take took advantage of the longer leave compared to those who had shorter leave. We don't find a increase in the likelihood to climb to the top 10 positions in terms of earnings within the firm, which you would think are the top positions, or positions like executive positions, CEOs, or directors. So the good news is we, we don't find a negative effect either, <laughs> but we, we don't find any effect. That's very depressing to me anyway. I mean... One of the best arguments for long-term parental leave, not just men, women, but men too, is to increase the chance of people developing further in their careers, I thought. So if this is the case, and that sounds very convincing, what argument is there for doing this kind of policy? Well, we do see that people use it, so especially women. They always use the extended leave, and they usually like, take the max leave. If we think of paid leave, that is up to a year maximum. So we don't talk about two years or three years. Now, one year is already perhaps quite long. So in Norway, they have split it since uh, 93 that part of the leave is, is earmarked to the father. So if the mother can take a certain amount and then the, the remaining, the father has to leave. Otherwise, they forgo this leave. So in total, together, they can take a year. However, our research also shows that also this that ta fathers take leave has no effect on the likelihood that the, the partner is more likely to climb to the top positions or women overall as a mean effect. However, we do see that parents take this leave. And so also we see you know, child care starts at age one. So, of course, it's a, a complementary system that parents can accomplish this to combine work and family, and having children. Okay, well, I hope the papers being given later on today are at all as depressing as this. So if paid leave doesn't really work in terms of this one goal anyway, maybe somehow changing corporate culture works. To that end, let me ask Zoe Cullen what her own research shows about this. Maybe there are ways of changing other aspects that solve this, what I view as a problem. Zoe, what do you think? I know, I mean, we, we know very little about how feasible it is to control or mediate corporate culture. So far be it from me to tell CEOs how to do this. But um, I would say it's likely that there are uh, some social norms in the workplace that uh, are, are affecting women's promotion chance. Um, and so, and actually my co-author Ricardo perez Chugli and I have studied a few of them. One being how much people actually talk about their salaries with each other and with their manager. So there's some evidence that <clears throat> we've provided where more transparency with what the manager is earning or the manager's manager does tend to incentivize uh, employees and in particular women to, to work harder. Um, 
Let me ask you this. Is it because, because of Linda Babcock's stuff, I think, showed that women just don't ask as much? Does the transparency reduce that apparent inability of women to be as asking? Is that it? So, yeah, it's it's possible. So, you know, the asking goes lots of directions. The asking goes between coworkers and between managers. And perhaps the asking that Linda's referring to is actually taking the information and then asking for a raise. Um, and, 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 you know, it, it, this is a slightly indirect evidence, but conditional on increasing um, women's knowledge about their, um, you know, what they would earn if they were to be promoted um, through, through releasing information just about average pay in a position above them. This does tend to increase the likelihood that they actually reach that position. So, uh, you know, if they're the, the indirect evidence, because we don't know exactly how they're using the information to either make different behavioral choices or to get the raise, but, but it makes, it seems to be informing their choices. Yeah. And then, you know, another and a very related, um, a very related issue is simply just the socializing that goes on as part of regular work. So um, in, in work with Ricardo, we've also shown that, uh, you know, if left unchecked in environments where there are lots of opportunities to have lunch together, or go get drinks together, male managers will typically spend um, about 30 percent more of their time with their male employees relative to their female employees. And we do see that over the course of a couple of years, that will translate into a significant salary gap. So we, our estimates, so we're looking at a corporation in Southeast Asia, but our estimates are over a couple of years, that will be um, about a, <clears throat> um, a, a gap in promotion that accumulates to be about a third of the overall promotion gap, like the unconditional yeah. promotion gap in the, in the organization. So, you know, and then we see in positions that are separated, you know, for reasons that can either be because of work from home or because the, the characteristics of the position just um, allow for the manager to be separated from the employee. We do see that this gap shrinks uh, in our setting, it shrinks to zero. So there's there's some suggestive evidence, I think, that in fact, um, you know, to the extent that managers uh, or CEOs, corporate executives can pay attention to these natural tendencies. It's it's conceivable that they could actually, uh, you know, inter intervene. So what you're saying is, this is a good side of the COVID crisis. If people aren't going in the office so much, the guys you know, someone, aren't going to get more attention than the women. That's I, you know, I, I would love for someone to 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 nail that coffin because, of course, we're not studying that period in our work, but. Um, but it would be kind of a natural extrapolation of of the of the setting that we that we found shut it down. Certainly, it would imply some symmetry in the results. I would be happy to bet you won't find this. In other words, it's asymmetric. This is a very nasty view on my part, but uh, so it's well worth elaborate, doing. That. Elaborate a little bit, Daniel, so I understand what you're saying. Well, what I inferred from what you said is that. Given a workplace where people are there, the, guy, the male managers will spend more time with the male subordinates and otherwise identical female subordinates. If you're not all together, then presumably you're not going to have that excess attention and the women should do better. I'd be happy to put money that that ain't going to happen, that kind of asymmetry. But I may be, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I, I would bet money I'm not. Anyway, that's very, very, very interesting. And Encouraging actions, in other words, there's a lever by which one could intervene, is what you're saying. How does one intervene? Well, I mean, so there, like I heard that the Yale SOM actually decided to introduce a policy to reduce any socialization outside, you know, formal interactions. However, oh, yeah. I, think there are, I think there are much easier solutions. So for example, you know, if your promotion committee was not just one person, but two people or three people, and maybe they were slightly more diverse, then that would be that would be one way to um, break that the importance of one relationship. Well, there certainly is research on that. Manuel Bag Bagway, who you may know or know of, has stuff on selection committees for judges in Spain, which suggests that there's some effect in that, not a hundred percent. Let me move on and ask. We've all talked about this policy parental leave or improving corporate culture, which I put in quotes in my questions. And, you know, there is one way to slice this and simply say, hey, darn it all, we're going to have quotas on boards or on the upper level. Let me ask Joanne what her work shows about this and what she thinks about it. 
Um, so having quotas can be effective, but only to a certain extent. So if the aim is to reduce uh, gender wage and representation gaps at the top of the firm, then sure, quotas do work. So uh, previously authors have found that um, they do benefit women who would have become board members, but did not become board members in the absence of the quota. And our work shows that um, quotas not only benefit, you know, uh, members on the corporate board, but there's also some evidence of trickle down effects um, to, for example, professionals um, in the firm and senior managers in terms of um, lowering the gender wage gap at those levels and increasing right. female representation. Um, however, unfortunately, we didn't observe further trickle down effects. So, yes, women at the top do benefit, and that is important because gender gaps at the top are the largest. But, you know, if the aim is to improve outcomes for a broad swath of women, then um, corporate board quotas are not going to be enough. This worries me because I think about other areas that I've worked in and thought about. And I worry that a lot of push for these quotas comes from the women who are already relatively better off than other women. And to some extent, they benefit themselves and others just like them. But the average woman, I certainly see this in economics, doesn't get much out of this tremendous push for equalization at the top. Let me ask another question, totally different, much more difficult. What are the efficiency effects of this on the bottom line for corporations? So there's some papers showing that there's short-term negative effects. Okay, so uh, in the Norwegian case, they found that stock prices actually fell for firms that would be most affected by this quota. Oh. And there was also some evidence in a fall in operational productivity in the short run. Um, but these reforms are relatively recent, so it's hard to say, um, you know, whether these negative effects will get better in the long run. Maybe as they find more experienced board members over time. Astrid, do you have anything to say about that sitting there at the Bergen Business School? Yes, it's interesting. Uh, that uh, Joanne is mentioning the Norwegian study that found negative results. Actually, there's a more recent replication of this study and extension of this study with uh, more up-to-date uh, data, but basically the same data, they, they refute this result, so they find a zero effect. <laughs> so I think there's also still something about uh, being careful about the data and, and of course, so there are lots of details about why they find the zero effect with the same data as they had before the negative, which was only one year after. But I, I agree generally that the results so far overall is quite mixed, whether the, the quotas lead to improved firm performance. So there are some studies like this um, with the Norwegian gender quota, which kind of convincingly can identify effects uh, also the studies that found positive employment effects like these firms were less likely to lay off workers so we may have to search also in other dimensions other stakeholders uh, where the firms improve their performance i see theoretically we should think i would argue that if discrimination is going on and somehow you cut through it, I would expect productivity to increase. There is a deadweight loss in discrimination. So to me, finding none is very disturbing since I believe theory predicts everything. So my priors are not negative, not even zero, but positive. And I'm surprised more of that hasn't been shown. It's very disturbing. Let me ask you a broad question, all three of you now. Chime in and turn any order you want. Look. By the year 2050, I mean, all three of you are likely to still be around. I surely won't. Will this problem have been completely wiped out? Will there be equality in the corporate leadership in Western countries and perhaps even in uh, Asian countries? Well, Astrid, you're on the screen. Why don't you go first, then we'll go around, okay? A prediction. A prediction. I guess you want a number, but I think no, that's extremely... I don't want a number. I want to go, will it get better? That's all get better. I think the, the question is much more complicated than is it gender equality? And because in a way, the question is about mothers, about parents, so that they can combine work and family. And, and the question is then, will we see top leaders who have 
have children at all and who have taken care of their children, participated equally with their partner in raising children. So I think that's the big question. And, and I think also whether we can, we manage given migrations and that societies become more and more heterogeneous, also in Norway in the migration, ethnic minority groups grow. So whether we, we achieve equality overall, because how can we imagine a world where women and men are equal, but not ethnic minorities, migrants, women with migrant background are treated equal. So I think there are lots of positive uh, happening. So my, I'm an optimist. So I think it will improve. It will probably go slow, but maybe also faster since the societies get more heterogeneous in all countries. And firms, is my feeling, are kind of moving ahead because they really acknowledge that they need to recruit the best talent. And so then they cannot uh, discriminate based on the name they have never heard or and uh, the stereotypes. I think there are more and more also firms use algorithms, robots to, to get over the first stages in recruitment. And there's a lot of exciting research also coming out that will help to inform firms and policymakers, also universities in the end, how we recruit. Right. Combination of these two, what's so seemingly unrelated areas, but you're saying they aren't. Joanne, what do you say? You're young enough to see the whole thing happen for sure. Go ahead. Um, I'm cautiously optimistic, so I think <laughs> Um, even in Asia, I think there's more of an awareness to increase diversity on, in firms, especially at uh, senior levels. But things can always backslide. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I guess there might be some progress, but, you know, things do backslide sometimes. So, for instance, we saw even things like abortion rights, which we thought was a done deal. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, that's a yeah. very sore subject to attack. Watch out, okay? Yeah. Yeah, so, so yeah, let's see. Okay, very good. Zoe, what do you think? Well, first, when you asked your question, I thought, well, you know, if we were to just take the last couple decades and sort of project forward along the dimensions we measure clearly, you know, we'd probably be asymptoting very slowly very slowly towards our our measures of, of equality. But I was thinking, you know, on that for just 30 more seconds and realized that actually some of the things that we're working on and really improving upon are just very difficult to measure. So I think currently the world is really focused on addressing issues of harassment, um, which is just something that, that you know, like we, we have a very hard time observing and um, and those issues might actually be very critical and a critical step towards these other end goals that we've been talking about, promotion and pay gaps. And so my, my sense is sort of, you know, it, it feels like there's a lot of attention on the issue. And, um, and, and I would, I would suspect that that, you know, like what we read about is pretty a good indication of the how issues are heating up and, and being addressed. So I, I am, yeah, I'm, I'm, I share these other women's views of, the optimistic outlook, and I, I do think we'll be making progress by 2050. I'd say for my granddaughter's sakes, I certainly hope your optimism, all three of your optimism, is well-founded. Let me ask you this, okay? If you observe the American Economic Association, the leadership is now almost all female, quite remarkably. And my two best female friends in the profession, Catherine Abraham and Fran Blau, are convinced this profession as a whole. So I know I've quoted authorities to you all. Will this change the nature of how academe works in economics? Or are we even more retrograde than the corporations you're talking about? As an American, Zoe, go ahead first, then we'll ask the others. <laughs> Yeah, so um, it's very cool. Um, and I've already received these emails that I think are quite exciting that are saying, oh, put your name on this list so that the next time someone says, oh, they just they'd love to invite a female labor economist. They just can't find one here. I can just give them this list. 
And I feel like these little policies are very, you know, like the leadership are cognizant of them and um, and and they might really they might really work. So I, I think it's it's very promising and it's changed the Twitter. It's certainly changed the Twitter feeds about the AEA. And um, yes, I think it's I, I'm, I don't even know. How long has it been for Daniel? How long has what been for the the new composition of the executive board? Well, it's been increasing over the years. The last several years, there are essentially no guys on it, yeah. for all intents and purposes. In fact, it looks like I was on the CSWEP board, as the, as Fran Blau said, the male representative. And I think now there's a male representative on the AEA board, and that's about it. Uh, Ashkid, what do you think? This is a bit further from your own thing, but there are similar things in Europe. There's a women in economics thing, European Economic Association. What do you think about this? I think it's a strong signal. No? So I think uh, in all firms, organizations, I think, and this has only come recently through that you really have to count and you have to report the gender gaps and representation of women which makes first visible to the inside and outside world uh, the composition. But I think then the next step is really important to have really diversity and inclusive uh, work policies. No? So like these lists with the speakers that, that people become visible, that's of course one measure, but there are many more. And I think also like mentor programs, I mean, are very popular, but I think we have to become very professional also in smaller universities and smaller institutions to to have really professional setups that we don't start always at a very low level and and knit a, a, an own mentor program, for example. But I think these these large like AA, the EA, they can play a very important function in in represent in signaling this uh, change and then also communicating lots of material and professional information and not the least research of course i welcome very much all this new research coming out on academics to study ourselves how how do we work actually right let me finish up by asking joanne as a non-american person a totally different culture how you feel about this how it's affecting to any extent in singapore mm -hmm. and the rest of southeast asia I think it's a it's a good signal, and I personally have benefited from the women mentoring network when I was in Europe. So, so that was very helpful. Um, as for like whether these will this will affect like how uh, we hire or tenure practices here, I think I haven't seen the impact yet. <laughs> um, however, I have noted that strangely enough, in Asia, there's actually more a greater proportion of women uh, in economics than in France where I was previously, for example. And, yeah. and yeah, it's always puzzled me as to why. Um, but I guess when I thought about it, I realized that there, the issue is um, who is interested in economics at the undergrad level and who pursues a PhD in economics. And I think that this subject segregation uh, is more of an issue in the West, in the West in very generalized terms, versus in at least like the East Asian uh, tiger economies. Um, Fascinating, because in some sense that goes against the stereotypes we have, and yet it's very gratifying to hear that. I didn't know that at all. Yeah, so maybe I, I don't. I don't know if it's the way economics is marketed to PhD, you know, PhD, prospective PhD students or to undergraduate students. Um, yeah, because I, I think that at the undergrad and, P, and uh, PhD level, there's still quite a, a small percentage of women at those levels. No, I think about thirty percent. The last time I checked, yeah. That's correct. Very good. Well, look, I want to thank you all. You all have to get going. We've had about 22 minutes, which is all we can afford. You guys got to get going to your conference. I wish you well. The papers just sound fascinating, especially the three of yours. So many thanks for helping out this morning. Take care. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Daniel. Thank you. Thanks to all you. Thanks, Dan. There, Oscar.